Hello, uh, uh, welcome to the final talk of this day uh, with uh, Vladimir Kulishov of Afresh. So Afresh uh, is a company that's tackling the problem of food waste. Uh, it's a problem with uh, immense climate impact and immense economic impact. About 30 to 40% of all food produced is wasted, uh, which actually represents uh, something like $165 billion loss to the US economy and uh, represents up to 25% of all emissions because producing food is an extremely emission intensive task. And uh, if, you, um, if you could have avoided producing the food uh, that would later be wasted, you have avoided a good amount of emissions. So Afresh uses model-based reinforcement learning uh, for inventory management of perishable goods, and they have achieved great results uh, and they're deployed in many uh, grocery stores around the US. And Vladimir is their co-founder and CTO. Uh, he's also an assistant professor at Cornell Tech. Uh, his work has been featured in Nature and in Scientific American. And uh, one more thing I want to say is uh, that uh, we are very thankful to Afresh for being a major sponsor of registration grants for students uh, that are with us today. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, having students be participating in climate tech is really important, and you guys are enabling that. So uh, handing over to Vladimir, please go ahead. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, I'm really excited to be presenting here today. Uh, again, as Eugene said, my name is Vladimir Kulishov, and I am the co-founder and chief technologist at Afresh. Uh, uh, Afresh is a startup that is tackling the food waste problem using machine learning and AI. And this is the topic that I would like to talk about today in this presentation. And uh, to begin, I would like to start with the problem of what is food waste. Food waste today is a massive, massive societal problem for the world. In the US, about 30 to 50% of all the food that is produced ends up being discarded. This is a massive societal problem, and it is also a huge financial problem for the US economy by various estimates the the magnitude of the loss uh, that is uh, that is caused by food waste is on the order of 400 billion dollars uh, within the us alone which represents roughly around two percent of us gdp by the way i will be giving a lot of numbers here in this presentation and these numbers come from a resource called uh, refed refed is a nonprofit consortium that collects facts and statistics about uh, food waste, food loss, and uh, its mission is to significantly reduce food loss uh, and um, through uh, various uh, awareness programs. So my source here for most of these numbers will be refed. Going back to uh, these statistics, food waste is a massive financial problem, and it is also a big uh, societal problem this food is being wasted, but in the, at the same time, more than 50 million Americans are food insecure. So this is obviously a big societal problem, but for the purposes of this presentation, I also want to highlight that food waste is an important environmental problem. Producing all of this food that is not being used is a massive strain on the environment. According to various statistics, again, coming from Refed, food waste is responsible for around 4% of US greenhouse gas emissions, 14% of all freshwater use, 18% of cropland use, 24% uh, of landfills are filled by food waste. So this is a hugely, uh, this is a huge inefficiency that is, that, that requires massive amounts of resources and it is impacting the environment in very, very significant ways. According to, uh, uh, to a different statistic, for example, if we were to just uh, look at the land that is being used in order to produce this food, it would be on the order of the that land would cover would be about the size of California. Uh, again, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem that's involved here. And most uh, the most the, the most relevant statistic I want to highlight for this conference and for this talk is uh, is the fact that food waste is also a massive climate problem. In order to uh, to grow this food, we need a lot of 
resources, a lot of energy, and this drives a massive amount of greenhouse gas emissions. The, one of the most well-known statistics is that if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest country, the third largest greenhouse gas emitter uh, in the world. So the emissions coming from the greenhouse gas emissions coming from food waste are only below that of China and the USA, and they're bigger than those of Russia, Japan, India, and uh, various developed world countries. So by tackling the food waste problem, it is possible to have a very significant and tangible impact on climate change. So how can we prevent food waste? Again, I'm going to turn to a statistic, a set of statistics that have been compiled by Refed, which again is this prominent national consortium that collects data on the food waste problem. And one of the biggest sources of, uh, one of the biggest factors that is influencing uh, inefficiency and the creation of food waste is supply chain inefficiency. Supply chain inefficiency is a big, big problem that is driving massive amounts of food waste. Here I am, uh, this is a screenshot from the Refed Insights engine. You can visit this URL to find more information about this topic. But at a very high level, you can see here that some of the main factors and some of the main levers also that can be influenced in order to reduce food waste are things like enhanced demand planning, decreased transit time, intelligent vehicle routing, more effective strategies to for how to process food inside the store, markdown optimization, selling imperfect produce. A lot of these um, uh, a lot of these methods are very uh, operational and supply chain type of solutions. And these are also the levers that we can influence using technology. So uh, to put it differently, there are a lot of opportunities for technology and for better operational processes for to use techniques from operations research, machine learning, uh, AI, data science to improve these processes and therefore have a significant impact on food waste and climate change. So uh, increasing the efficiency of the supply chain in order to reduce food waste is one of the main goals that is uh, that, that we're tackling at Afresh. So Afresh is a company that uh, I co-founded and our mission is to automate the food supply chain using AI and machine, and machine learning in order to significantly reduce this food waste uh, while also serving the needs, uh, serving the business needs of our customers and do this in a complementary way. So uh, Afresh is a startup that was founded in 2017. It came out as a, out of Stanford. Uh, or originally, it was started as a research project uh, between the computer science department and the business school. Uh, originally, uh, uh, me and my co-founders, we were students at Stanford when we started exploring this problem. And we realized the magnitude of the, of the food waste problem in the US. We, we, uh, worked with supermarkets and we realized the extent of the inefficiencies that are present there and the way in which they're impacting uh, and, and the extent of the waste that, that is being generated through these inefficiencies. And so we decided to start this company in 2017 to tackle this problem using technology. Over the last four years, we have raised several rounds of funding uh, and we have uh, secured partnerships and deployments at several uh, regional grocery chains across the US. And as of 2020, we've, we're deployed across uh, three chains that have about 200 stores among them, and they have about $10 billion of revenue combined across them. And we are deployed in these stores and we are using our AI based automation software to increase their efficiency, to significantly reduce their food waste, uh, increase their profits and also improve uh, and, and by reducing food waste, uh, reduce their environmental footprint. 
So in this talk, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the technology that Refresh is building and the, um, the impact that it's having on real world food waste in the, in, in our, in the supply chain. So the focus of Afresh is on grocery food waste. So why is there an opportunity in grocery for a system like Afresh? Here, this picture illustrates this opportunity. What you see here are so-called uh, paper ordering sheets that are used within a large US grocery chain. Uh, this is one of the largest grocery chains. They have $8 billion in revenue, and they use these paper sheets in order to make ordering decisions in every store in their chain. So this is a very inefficient way of doing things, uh, clearly. This is a pen and paper system, and through this pen and paper system, they, uh, and they here being the operator of the store, uses uh, they use these paper sheets and their intuition to make really important operational decisions in every store, such as how much do I want to order from the warehouse? At what price do I want to sell it? Where do I put it in the store? All of these key operational decisions that significantly impact their waste are currently made using pen and paper and uh, human intuition. And clearly, this is an opportunity where machine learning can improve things and automation can significantly improve these processes. So what we do at Afresh is that we replace these, uh, this pen and paper system using a computerized system uh, where the interface through which the operator inside a store interacts with our system now becomes a tablet. And this is what this tablet might look like. And uh, so all their operations are digitized while still maintaining their usual workflow. And crucially, this system is uh, this tablet or this interface interfaces with a machine learning engine that lives in the cloud. And the machine learning engine computes daily recommendations for how the operator should operate the store. So you can think of this as being a control center for the store. And this control center has this automation self-driving engine, which every day recommends the optimal set of decisions. And the user only needs to review this. And if they disagree with something, they can change it. But otherwise, in a normal state, they would approve our decisions. And effectively, the store will be running on an autopilot and uh, making decisions about replenishment and other kinds of uh, critical operational decisions will be based on data as opposed to human intuition through the use of our machine learning engine. So this is at a high level, the system that we're building. And in the rest of the talk, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the technical challenges that are involved in building the system and the impact that it's having in the industry. So what is the technical task or what is the machine learning task that is being solved here? The main focus, uh, the main problem that our system is tackling at the moment is the problem of inventory control. So in other words, we want to determine what is the optimal set of, um, of items, what is the optimal number of items that the, that, the, that the store should be carrying on any given day for hundreds to thousands of items in hundreds of stores and uh, up to using up to thousands of years of data. And the general approach that we're using to tackle this problem is that of model-based control. So when we work with a supermarket chain, they share with us their historical data set, which includes their histor historical prices, uh, sales, shipments. Uh, and we use this data to build a probabilistic model of the world which means that we, uh, we build a model which outputs a probability distribution over what will happen in the future. And the key variable that we want to predict, uh, the, key the key source of uncertainty here is demand. So demand is one of the main things that we want to predict. We output a probability distribution over future demand. That is the modeling part. And then there is 
a second component called uh, a planning component, which determines the best decisions for the store in order to maximize the store's objective subject to the predicted probabilities from the first step. So in other words, given a forecasted demand, uh, then the second stage of our system will determine the best set of orders for them, given all the constraints that they might have, which includes shelf space, um, routing, warehouse constraints, shipping constraints. Uh, this is solved by the model-based planner approach. And overall, this approach is called uh, model-based control or model-based planning. It's a standard approach within the general field of decision-making and reinforcement learning. And it is a natural approach that we take here for this problem. And again, the output of the system is a set of recommended orders, daily recommended orders that they follow and that significantly improve the efficiency of the store. So what are some challenges involved in building this kind of system? Um, the first, uh, so first I want to highlight some challenges related to this probabilistic component that I described. Uh, again, the goal of this predictive system is to output a probability distribution over future demand given some state that the system is in, where the state can describe the prices, the state of the warehouse, the, the you know holidays, weather, any sort of features that are relevant here. One of the challenges that we're facing is that we have to make a large set of predictions based on a large amount of data. As I said earlier, we when we partner with a customer uh, with a with a grocery chain, we get data for hundreds to thousands of stores that cover years, which means that uh, we have years of historical data, which is on the order of thousands of days, and we have this uh, for hundreds to thousands of items. So this is a data set of 100 million plus data points that we have, where each data point is something that happened on a specific day in a particular store for a particular item. And we need to leverage systems that we need to build machine learning technologies that scale to these large data sets. So internally, we rely on modern advances in machine learning, specifically on deep learning, in order to scale to these large data sets and use all of this data effectively. Um, so we use probabilistic and Bayesian neural networks to output these probability distributions. Um, but then on the other hand, even though we have a lot of data overall on aggregate for all of the items in all of the stores, for each specific store, uh, for each specific item in each specific store, we only have perhaps a few years of data, which is on the order of thousands of data points. So for each time series, which is again, each item in each store, we have relatively little data. So we have both uh, a big data problem and a small data problem in some sense. Uh, and in particular, we are facing with challenges such as rare events, such as holidays or new items or new stores. For example, uh, suppose we want to predict the sales of an item over Thanksgiving. If we have only three years of data, we only have three instances of Thanksgiving in our data set. And we want to be accurate on those uh, rare events because they're usually particularly important for the store. So how do, how do we do this given that we only have three instances of Thanksgiving for a particular item in a particular store? Again, the general approach here is based on deep learning and in particular multitask deep learning where we train one large model that covers the entirety of this data set. And in particular, it can use the fact that the same item can be sold in multiple stores. And by observing its response to Thanksgiving in different stores or in adjacent stores, we have increased signal about how, how it will perform in our query store. We can also look at related items in the same store. So for example, if we have oranges and grapefruit that are being sold in a store. Uh, those are similar items. And by training a joint model, we can take signal from one time series and use it to improve accuracy on the other. Uh, and also, if a new store opens, we can often be very accurate for the store because we have seen the performance of the same item in different stores. Again, this is something that we can handle using the general approach of multitask deep learning. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, in order to make 
um, well, the goal of this system is to make accurate decisions in the end. And in order to do this, we need to not only output a single point prediction, but we need to output a probabilistic forecast. And this is part of the, um, this is also part of our, of our, of our, of our system. It's a key design decisions, the decision that we have made um, as part of our engine. All our models are probabilistic and they output an entire distribution over future demand. And this allows us to do more effective planning. I will come back to this later, but this is the third uh, high level uh, design feature of our system. And similarly, we are, um, we are tackling some really interesting challenges on the decision-making part as well. As I mentioned earlier, once we have a probabilistic prediction, we need to make an effective decision. But this decision needs to account for various customers' objectives. For example, different customers might care differently about min minimizing stockouts versus minimizing waste. Uh, they might care about shelf appearance. Um, there are a lot of uh, constraints such as delivery times, the recipes that are involved here. Uh, and at the same time, a lot of these, a lot of important variables are not observed. For example, we don't always fully observe the inventory that is in these stores. We don't really know the freshness of the items. So we have to make these decisions in a partially observed environment. And the high level technical design choices we have made in order to, to solve these problems are uh, this model-based control approach where for each customer, we can encode their needs using an expected utility function and then we can optimize this utility function. Uh, we can work with the customer to understand their needs and translate them into constraints and objectives. This is something that our model-based control framework naturally allows us to do. And it's something that's, it's an important business consideration that it allows us to solve. And also a key part of our system is the fact that we're relying on human in the loop AI. A lot of these well, human in loop AI is important for two, two reasons. One is that we need to build trust with our users. When we surface these recommendations, it is really important that the users trust them and follow them. And a lot of our users are, um, they, they may not be used to this kind of technology. Uh, they may not have had a lot of experience working with a tablet before. Uh, they may have been using a pen and paper system for decades before this. And so we really, really, we really need to build that trust and so the human in the loop aspect, and in particular, the design aspects of our system are really important. It's something in which we have invested a lot of effort and thought. And conversely, in order to improve the performance of the AI system, it really helps to be able to query the operator for certain key um, information. For example, we may want to double check them about the state of inventory in a particular store for a particular item. And this is something that we can do through the design of our app and it allows us to significantly improve the performance of our model-based control engine so the human both the, the control and the human in the loop aspects are really important um, features of our decision making system that have a very significant impact on its performance overall um, so, so far, this was a very high level overview of our system and the different kinds of challenges that we're facing and the different uh, general technical approaches that we've been using. Um, for more details, uh, you, if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at some of our uh, work in this area that we have published in the, um, in the machine learning research community. So for example, uh, certain design decisions that we have made, uh, we have published uh, research at some of the top conferences in machine learning. Uh, so here we have two papers from ACML. We also had a paper at NeurIPS in 2019 on different aspects, different technical problems that we've been facing. Uh, so perhaps not the overall description of our system, but certain specific technical problems uh, that we're facing, we've covered uh, some aspects of our solution in a lot of detail in these research papers. And a lot of this work is very state of the art. Uh, so these are um, uh, papers that describe novel research uh, that has been peer reviewed by the machine learning research community. Uh, 
and it has a, it, it is appearing at these top venues in this field. Uh, so a lot of this work is really cutting edge, really interesting. I would encourage you to look at these papers for the full, full details. Uh, for this talk, I would like to spend a little bit of time on some of the technical aspects that are described in these papers. Uh, and I would like to take maybe five, six slides to tell you a little bit more about some high level ideas that we've uh, explored uh, in our system and that we have published in these papers. So this is going to be now a slightly more technical part of the talk, uh, a few slides, and then I'll go back uh, to a more high level description and I will talk about the results and how our system performs in the final few slides. So let's dive in here in some technical detail. As I mentioned, our system is based on model-based planning. And we are performing planning under this predictive probabilistic model of the future. And a natural question that arises in this line of work is, what makes a good predictive probabilistic system? What makes a good probabilistic forecast what are the properties and characteristics that it needs? And how do we enforce those probabilities? One of the key takeaways of the two papers that I mentioned before is that the predictions from a probabilistic model, in order to be useful for decision making, we argue that it's really important that they have this, this feature called calibration. Calibration intuitively means that a 90% confidence interval contains the true outcome 90% of the time. It's a very natural property of a probabilistic prediction. But surprisingly, if you take most off the shelf machine learning systems, they don't have this property. And in fact, they, they perform very poorly according to this metric. So this is an example of a time series forecast that you would get if you were to just run a Bayesian neural network on a time series problem and just use the out of the box probabilistic predictions. So here, the, um, the green interval corresponds to a 90% confidence interval from this system. So you can see that it roughly follows the shape, the correct shape of the time series. But most points, most of these red points fall outside the 90% confidence interval. So the model here is extremely overconfident. And this is an example of a, even though this is a a standard, this is this would be standard behavior out of a modern probabilistic deep learning system. Uh, this is what is called uncalibrated. Most points are, fall outside the 90% interval. An example of a good forecast that would have this calibration property that I mentioned and that we're advocating for in our in our papers. Most of it would be uh, an example of a calibrated forecast would be something like this. Here, our green interval is wide and it covers about 90% of the points as it should. And every interval, so uh, an 80% interval would cover 80% of the points and so on. So this is an example of a calibrated forecast. And that's what we would like to have out of our probabilistic uh, predictive system. Uh, and this is also something that we have explored in our work uh, at Refresh. And we have developed improved systems. Uh, we have developed algorithms that allow us to obtain such improved, higher quality probabilistic forecasts out of deep learning systems. And we have used them to uh, improve the performance of our downstream um, uh, control system. All right, so again, this slide is saying that ideally, we want forecasts which look like this and not like this. So why is it important to have this calibrated forecast? Well, intuitively, we want to use these decisions, uh, these forecasts for making accurate decisions. And in order to make accurate decisions, we need to have accurate probabilities on every outcome that is going to happen. For example, um, maybe in a slightly different setting that's a little bit easier to understand, imagine that you have uh, a self-driving car uh, and uh, this self-driving car has a model of what will happen if I turn the wheel or if I accelerate or if I press on the gas pedal. And uh, here the orange curve is the distribution of what will happen, let's say if I accelerate or if I if I perform some kind of action, 
the green, the the orange curve here, the orange bell curve tells me what will happen in the future. But an uncalibrated model will uh, be typically overconfident, and it will produce something which looks like the blue curve here. And clearly, the blue curve is too narrow. And so now, if I use this curve to make decisions, well, if I'm overconfident, if I think I'm going to be landing here, but actually there's a high chance that I'm going to land in these tail regions, that will significantly influence my decisions. And it might lead the car to make risky decisions, which will make it, which, which will lead it here. For example, if there's a person that happens to be standing in this part of the space and uh, the it thinks that the probability of reaching here is basically zero, but the actual probability is much wider and it can, and there's a significant chance of it landing here, then there's a significant chance of it taking a bad decision that, uh, an unsafe decision that will lead it to uh, impact the person that would stand here. This is an example of how overconfident and uncalibrated decisions can adversely impact the performance of control systems or decision-making systems. And more generally, having accurate uh, probabilistic uh, predictions are useful. They're useful for safety, which I mentioned, but they're also useful for balancing exploration and exploitation. If I, if I have a, an accurate probabilistic model, I can better gauge when I need to explore and when I need to exploit my environment. Uh, I mentioned safety. Uh, also, just in terms of finding a policy which maximizes the reward, if I want to compute the expected value under this model, it will be more accurate if my probability is more accurate, in particular if it's calibrated. Uh, and also, calibration is a natural way of uh, providing interpretable predictions. So, for example, if I want to, if we have a human in a loop system and an operator is going to be using our system, it is really useful if we're able to say that for these items we're 90% confident, for these items we're 60% confident, and then the operator can use this probability to determine which parts of it, uh, which parts of the decisions they want to expect inspect further, and which ones don't require any additional inspection. Um, so accurate, calibrated probabilities are important for decision making. That is the slide here. And now, how do we obtain such probabilities? Here, uh, this is a very high level outline of the algorithm that we have uh, proposed in one of our XML papers. And it is based on a technique called recalibration. So at a high level here, this is a, a visual description of a basic machine learning system. It takes some input and uh, the model, you can think of it, if you were to write out the math, you can think of it, the model as being uh, a forecaster H, which takes a feature vector X and outputs a probability over Y. So now this is going from the space of Y to 0, 1. So this is a probability distribution. And the model takes an input and it outputs a function, which is a probability distribution. And this is the, the function. We call it F. It's the forecast. And again, this is a probability. So F of Y is a number between 0, 1, which is a probability of, uh, of seeing Y. This is a visual representation of a standard predictive forecasting system. Um, what we proposed in this work, and again, for the full details, I would refer you to the ACML paper, uh, but we proposed a general technique where we learn a particular function R, and R is applied over every F. So instead of outputting F, we always output R of F of Y instead of just Y. And R maps the unit interval into the unit interval, so the output of this is still going to be a probability between 0 and 1. But it will be designed in a careful way such that these forecasts, such that these probabilities are improved and they're no longer overconfident. They will be calibrated and this will improve their performance for decision making. So how do we design this R? Well, there is a simple way. We have this definition called calibration, which is here. And this captures the intuition that I gave you earlier. Again, if you don't fully understand the formula, um, I think understanding the intuition is fine, uh, but essentially it just says that um, in a binary classification setting, the probability of having an outcome of one, uh, if I condition on uh, me predicting 80% confidence, the probability of success is 80%. Okay, so this is some, this can be any event, and condition on me predicting 80% probability of these events. So out of the times when I predicted 80%, 
the probability of seeing the actual probability of seeing this event is 80 percent it's just a simple mathematical formula for calibration and now how do we find an r such that this formula holds well uh there is a simple uh fact and you can kind of see it by staring at it for a while uh or again you can look at the paper for the full details but essentially if you have um uh, if you use the following function for r then you can convince yourself that this will output uh, a calibrated prediction and essentially what it does is that r is actually uh you can learn the probability of so here f is fixed now f is given to you and for each p we can measure the actual number of times that we have seen success out of the times when we predicted 80 percent so let's say that we have uh, we're predicting 80 percent we can measure the actual empirical probability of having a success out of the times when we predicted 80 percent we can learn that and then we can correct we can output uh, we can output this actual probability when I say 80%. So let's say if out of the times when I predict 80%, success actually happens 60% of the time, then this function will map 80 to 60 and the result will be calibrated. <coughs> and this is now, this is only, uh, so this is a probability distribution. It's a function of our data distribution. And because it's a function of our data distribution, we can learn it from data using standard techniques in machine learning. Uh, now this just becomes a density estimation problem uh, and we can use standard techniques to solve this. Sorry, Vladimir, just want to give you a heads up that, that we're, we have nine minutes remaining. Um, and so let's just allocate yeah. all that for questions. Yeah, sounds good. I have maybe five more minutes left. Oh. Um, all right, so we have, um, uh, so this is a general algorithm for producing these calibrated predictions that I mentioned. Uh, we had another paper at ICML 2019 where we showed that if we use this technique, it improves standard machine learning tasks uh, in reinforcement learning. Um, if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, there's a standard benchmark that's used in many, many papers. It's a, it's a standard benchmark in the community called Mujoko. And the idea here is that you're in this virtual world and you control these different robots and uh, they have joints and, you're, and you have to use reinforcement learning to figure out how to move the joints. Uh, and you can have different policies and you're maximizing some reward. You get reward if you get it to work uh, correctly. If it falls out, if it falls down, then you get, then you lose and you want to make it move as fast as possible. And uh, this is, uh, these two curves show the reward as a function of how much you train the algorithm. And if you use this calibrated model, then you perform better, you learn faster, uh, and in some cases, significantly faster if you have a calibrated probability distribution. So basically, calibration improves the quality of decision-making policies on standard control tasks. And in addition, it also performs better on inventory management tasks. Uh, so we can model inventory management as also this kind of markup decision process where I have some sort of state, uh, this is my current inventory position. Uh, then I get to make a decision, I get to make an action, that's the shipment. And then I observe a random number of sales, some spoilage. Uh, so this transitioned me to a different state. And this basically defines a control problem or a markup decision process or um, this, this defines a decision-making problem, and I can find a policy for uh, making these shipments that that involves learning the transition dynamics. And if these transition dynamics are calibrated using our algorithm, then uh, we achieve higher reward, where reward here is measured by profit. If we use our technique, then we improve over the uh, profits that we would have obtained using the the we get higher reward than what we would obtain what, what we would have obtained if we had used these. Uh, other state-of-the-art uncertainty estimation techniques. So this is a benefit of using this for our... Uh, this, this again shows that by thinking about how to design better probabilistic forecasting systems, we can significantly improve the performance of decision-making systems, both on standard reinforcement learning benchmarks and on uh, this inventory control problem, which is what we're solving at Fresh. So this concludes the technical part of the talk. I just want to quickly mention a few um, I want to quickly mention one result that we've had. So this is going to be data from a deployment of the system in one store uh, over a trial period of six weeks. And I want to show you uh, a, a small example of what happens when we launch our system in a typical supermarket. Um, so this here, this curve, it shows 
the cumulative waste of the store since the beginning of the year, since January. And then as we increase this, uh, uh, I guess as time, uh, as time progresses, you know, they waste more over time. And um, so basically when, it, when this curve increases, it's bad. When it stays flat, it's good. So this was the beginning of the year. And then we turned on our system and immediately we saw waste stabilize. Then suddenly our operator, uh, he was sick and his assistant started ordering and his assistant wasn't really uh, confident. He didn't want to use our system and he wasn't sure if it, he wasn't trained to use our system. And so he started overriding all, all our recommendations and immediately waste went up and it went up for a week until our operator came back and started using the system again and waste stabilized. So this is an interesting A-B test that we inadvertently conducted in this uh, in the store, which shows the difference between our system and a human operator. And more generally, as I mentioned earlier, Afresh has been deployed at more than 200 supermarkets. We've seen uh, reductions in waste by an average of 25%. And at the same time, we've been able to significantly grow the sales and the both the both the sales growth and the margin on those uh, uh, the, the, the profit margin on those sales by significant amounts. Uh, and of course, this also leads to huge reductions in inefficiencies. Our system is currently deployed in 200 stores. By the end of this year, we expect to be deployed in even more stores. We expect to be deployed in 2000 stores. Uh, and we expect uh, at the end, when, once our 2021 pilot is complete, we expect to be processing produce uh, about 10% of all U.S. produce sales will be going through our system once our current set of pilots completes or uh, converts. So I guess to summarize all of this, um, I just want to again reiterate that food waste is a problem. It's a very significant environmental problem, but we can have a significant impact on addressing this problem using tools from uh, reinforcement learning, AI, uh, and this is a great opportunity. If you're interested, we're very, very actively hiring for technical and non-technical roles. Uh, so please uh, reach out to me afterwards if you would like to, uh, to to get involved in this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vladimir, for an excellent talk. Um, we have time for a few questions. So uh, the first question here is, uh, does the percentage of 30 to 50 percent of discarded food uh, does this count just waste at the at grocery stores or also food bought but not eaten at home or restaurants? Uh, it does. It includes everything. 30 to 50 percent is from the farm to the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the statistics is around 70 to 80 percent of this happens at consumer facing businesses and downstream. So this would mean mm -hmm. grocery stores, supermarkets and the consumers. And so mm -hmm. by impact, by working on uh, grocery food waste, we can have a lot of impact on the overall waste. Uh, mm -hmm. both at the grocery level and then, of course, at the consumer level, because if they buy a fresher item, the item will stay longer in their fridge and uh, mm -hmm. it will, it's also less likely to be wasted. And uh, I guess I would guess uh, that your solution might also be applicable to restaurants and like other institutions that just purchase food, right? Uh, yes, we are not currently deployed at any restaurants, but mm -hmm. of course, our vision is to automate the supply chain, both mm -hmm. the uh, upstream and downstream from grocery stores. So, mm -hmm. yes. Awesome. Um, so uh, another question, this one's for me. So for stores that use these paper ordering sheets, how do you get their data for training? Like, do you have to scan those paper sheets from a few years ago or do they have anything digitized at all? When they write their order on the, on the paper sheet, that's when they walk the store. And then they go back to their, they, they go to the back of the store and they have some old DOS computer in which, mm -hmm. to which they transcribe by hand what they wrote on the paper sheet. Uh, and then that gets digitized. And uh, ultimately, when something is shipped from the warehouse to the store, so at the warehouse, they have an old 90s style uh, mm -hmm. database system that tracks all of these things, and we can pull data from that. Got it. So they, I guess they do have a database, but they just like don't interface with it directly. Uh, but they uh, interface. Yeah, they, they, they interface with it, but they don't, uh, I guess those, those sheets, they may have something which comes from database printed on them sometimes, mm -hmm. usually not. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't use it to make intelligent decisions uh, or mm -hmm. the, the data lives there, but there's no machine learning to um, mm -hmm. use it to improve the, the operator decisions. Got it. Uh, another question. Um, how does the model based planning account for seasonal variations, especially in produce? Uh, because like a display of fresh produce might generate additional demand, for example. Yes, this would be in the predictive part. Uh, mm -hmm. So we definitely 
definitely the time of the year is a really important feature for the predictive component. Mm -hmm. And it's something that would be learned based on historical data. So we have multiple years of data and we can see that certain items might sell more in some mm -hmm. months than in other months. And I guess you also touched on it a little bit. Uh, so because the display might regenerate additional demand, that's probably why you need reinforcement learning rather than just forecasting here, right? Because there's a feedback. Uh, this here. is something that yeah, this is something that could be modeled in this approach. Uh, we mm -hmm. could see that okay, if we order more, then it will be in a state with larger uh, in with more inventory, and more inventory mm -hmm. can lead to more demand. So it's something mm -hmm. that we could plan as part of the of the planner if we kind of expand this sequence of mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you. And one final question: uh, How do customers consistently and accurately measure waste uh, to be able to feed it back into the system? The way we measure it is we look at everything that comes in and everything that comes out of the store. So everything that is shipped to the store and then everything that, that is sold from the store. And usually yeah. there's a pretty big difference between them. Of course, mm -hmm. some it can be uh, maybe the, someone dropped the eggs on the floor uh, mm -hmm. or you know theft theoretically is possible, but mm -hmm. um, by far the main driver of this difference is waste. And mm -hmm. this is typically how it's measured. Got it. Um, yeah. Um, thank you so much. So we're at the end of the time slot. Yeah, this was a, a great talk. And uh, see you, see you, everybody in the audience tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you for and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.